We missed y'all last week, and Brother Butch did a wonderful job for us with the Gideon presentation. I thank him for that. We had a nice time of vacation. Uh, we had a great time, really. We had uh, went to the beach, and uh, I became a lobster, uh, primarily because I didn't listen to the voice of my wife that kept saying, put on sunscreen, put on sunscreen. By the time I listened, it was far too late. Uh, but the first day of the beach, we uh, had a hotel there on the, the beach, we went out, we set up, and uh, where we set up, it's really nice, there was no obstruction between us and the water, we could just see out there as far as the eye could see, the waves rolling in, the gentle, uh, calming breeze, and I just sat there, and it was just this idyllic, beautiful moment, as I just sat there and just relaxed, enjoyed the peacefulness of the moment. And uh, in the midst of that peacefulness, all of a sudden I heard and felt splat. I looked down and a bird pooped on me. (laughs) My first thought is, are you kidding me? Like all these people, my wife's right there. Why did you choose this target? (laughs) It was the red one. the, uh, no, the second thought I had is, you know, when life gives you lemons, uh, this is going to be a sermon illustration. So there you go. The very beginning of my vacation, I knew how I was going to start this sermon. <laughs> uh, I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. This morning we're going to gain a glimpse of the glory of God. Now as we begin to dive into the parts of Revelation with these images and symbols, it's easy to get lost in the weeds and to miss the point. So I want us to start by understanding that the point this morning is about a proper perspective. Whether it's idyllic moments in your life that can cause you to forget God. Because you know life is good, nothing's wrong, what do I need all that God stuff for? Or it's birds defecating on your idyllic moment and ruining it. You lose your job, you lose your health, you lose the relationship. It's vital to maintain a proper perspective on life. It's vital to remember who God is. This morning we'll see that he is holy and that he is worthy. And I believe that keeping his glory before us is what will help us deal rightly with every moment that we face. We've sung God's praises as we prepare for God's word. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you have blessed us abundantly and that we have this place to gather freely and to worship according to conscience. But Lord, worship according to conscience is worthless if it's not according to truth. And so we thank you for truth. The truth of your word, of the gospel, and of Jesus, the Messiah. We praise you and thank you that you have rescued us through the Lamb who was slain that we might one day in eternity sing your praises with all the saints. I thank you, Lord, for a glimpse of that this morning as I heard your people lift their voices up declaring that you are holy, holy, holy. I pray, Lord, that your word and your spirit would give us a greater glimpse of that now and that you would prepare us for that blessed day that we sing in your presence forever and ever. You are worthy of praise, worthy of glory. And you are worthy, Lord, for us to turn our attentions to your word now with open hearts. So please, Lord, help us. We pray for your grace and that you would glorify yourself in our midst. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 4. Uh, Last time we finished the seven letters to the seven churches, and the Apostle John, having received these letters from Christ, is now uh, brought into the revelation uh, that most people think about with uh, end times and weird images and symbols and things like that. Uh, And as we begin this, we're going to see that before God gets to all the judgment and all of the death and all of the chaos and all of the difficult uh, features of the book of Revelation that John has invited, a grand invitation to see the most important image that we're going to see in the book of Revelation, and that is God on his throne. If you'll begin reading with me in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, 
John writing, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. So pausing there for just a moment, um, you know, Jesus it's the first voice that he heard. We saw back in chapter 1, like a trumpet as Christ calls to John. Here he calls again to John. And there's this invitation to come up uh, into heaven, this open doors. You remember Jesus opens the doors, he shuts the doors. And so he invites John to come up uh, to see the things that must take place after these things. And now, this is one of those phrases in Revelation that people debate about. What does this mean? Is this a chronological statement? Is this uh, meaning that after this point in Revelation, we're viewing all the events that take place after a rapture, or after the church age, or after the letters to the churches? All those questions we can really cause us to lose focus on really the point of the passage when we shift focus on those things that don't really matter. John is saying, after these things, I was given this invitation. And like Moses before him, who was called by God, come up on the mountain to receive the law. John is called to come up into heaven and to receive this vision. And he's going to be shown all of these things that have to, have to pass. These seal judgments and trumpet judgments and bold judgments. There's going to be uh, great depravity on the earth. There's going to be great persecution for the saints. There's going to be great death. There's going to be great suffering. And he's saying... Uh, Jesus saying, John, I want you to come up. I'm going to show you all these things. And as John comes up, the first thing that he sees is God on his throne. And we need to understand that coming into this, this is setting the perspective for the rest of the book of Revelation. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 is the key if we're going to understand how to respond to everything else that we're going to see in this book. And the, the key is seen in the fact that as judgment is about to begin, as death and chaos are about to reign on the earth, God is not out of control here. God is not somehow taken by surprise here. God is not contending with some evil force here. That everything that we're going to read is seen with the perspective of God is reigning on His throne. In fact, as we start this uh, really, the heart of Revelation, we'll see God reigning on His throne. And as we finish Revelation in chapter 22, we'll see God reigning on His throne in the midst of His people. This is the key to Revelation, God reigning supreme. And so John is invited up to see the things that are going to take place after these things. Verse 2, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And, and, and before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature like a, uh, had a face like a, that of a man, and the, the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. So John enters into heaven. It's a spiritual experience. His body's still there on Patmos. We don't know exactly how it all worked, but he, in the spirit, goes up into heaven and, and he sees this throne sitting in heaven. So he, he's, he's really in a, a long line of other prophets who have been given images into the throne room of God, whether it's Isaiah, as we read earlier, or Ezekiel, who saw the movable throne of God on the earth, or Daniel, who sees uh, the Ancient of Days sitting on his throne. And so there's a lot of similarity between what we see here and what we see in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. Daniel, uh, in fact, scholars believe that, that John was often 
uh, wording it according to what he read in the Old Testament. I personally believe that it's just the same God on the same throne in the same room. And so he's seeing what these others have seen and he maybe describes it a little bit differently. Um, but he's describing the same event because God who was, who is, who is to come always reigns on his throne. But it's interesting as we come, we, we begin with this throne sitting in heaven and, and John, he, he begins to kind of radiate out from the throne as he builds this, this picture of what he sees and we're going to see this even more next week as he goes further and further and further out from the throne until all creation is taken into account. But, but here in the very center of his whole vision is this throne and one who's sitting on the throne and John does not dare to name the one sitting on the throne. If you notice that John doesn't even really describe the one sitting on the throne. When he says he's going to describe his appearance, he begins to speak in these, these light terms of these, uh, these jewels that are uh, revealing light and, and glory and majesty. So really all that John can do is depict the glory of God as it's radiating out from him. He doesn't really uh, give us a depiction of God because no man can see God and live. He is holy. And so John looks at this, he sees his throne, and he says the one sitting on the throne, he was like a jasper stone, a sardius in appearance, and jasper, and we don't know exactly what all he meant by these stones, but we have a pretty good idea, and jasper was uh, perhaps because of how John uses it elsewhere in Revelation, a clear gem, maybe like a diamond, that uh, would refract, refract the light, and uh, sardius, Carnelian, uh, depending on what your translation is, was likely a red blood stone that was uh, very famous for the territory of Sardis as we uh, read the letter to the church in Sardis. And so he's, he's talking about these, these stones, these gems that are uh, beautiful in appearance but also are able to refract light and to shine forth light. And then he, he says that around the throne was this rainbow, or, or some translations may read a halo, but uh, this this rainbow that's like an emerald in appearance. And this emerald, uh, the word for that may simply be referring to a translucent stone that's able to, to show out this uh, rainbow uh, spectrum of color as light passes through it. It's a very odd description is basically we just have this throne and out from this throne is just radiating this immense spectrum of light and color. Absolute beauty and glory just spilling out from the throne. And that's all John can say about the one sitting on the throne. He doesn't see a face, doesn't see hands, doesn't see a body. All he sees is his glory just radiating out from the throne. You see, we, we, as we come into this revelation, as we come into this image, we need to understand that what John is seeing here is the holiness of God. God is other. He is beyond. He is above. He is separate. He is not like us. He cannot be compared to us. He is not like this world that he made. He cannot be compared to this world. Words do not do justice to who God is. And John is just trying to give us just a little glimpse of the glory of God that's just spilling out of this throne as heaven is being filled with this glorious light and color. And then around the throne we have these 24 elders. We'll talk more about them in just a moment. Uh, sitting on their 24 thrones, clothed in white, which is a symbol of purity, and golden crowns, which typically is an indication of royalty. But notice that from the throne we have these flashes of lightning, sounds, and peals of thunder. Now these three words are used together quite often in Scripture, particularly in Revelation. We'll see it multiple times. Um, but you see it all the way back whenever God shows up on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, and, and thunder is shaking, lightning is flashing out from the presence of God. But as we go through Revelation, we read these words here, this lightning and thunder and sounds, that, that we're going to see it's always in the context of judgment. That when we begin to, to see and to hear these things, it's because God is ready to judge those who dwell on the earth. In, in fact, all of these images, the sea of glass, things like that, uh, are, are typically used in the book of Revelation of judgment. And so when John comes into this image and he sees God on his throne, and he sees all of this stuff taking place around God, he's seeing a God who is ready to judge those who are on the earth. We have this uh, fire that's burning before God, the seven spirits of God. If you remember, we said in chapter 1 that the seven spirits of God is probably a symbolic way to talk about the Holy Spirit. But the, the Spirit of God is before God as, as these torches that are burning. If you remember in the temple of old, you had the, the lampstand with seven lamps and continually burning before the presence of God. 
And so the Spirit of God is sitting there burning before the presence of God. You have these four living creatures, odd creatures. It's really difficult to say exactly what they are. Uh, seraphim, cherubim, whatever they may be. Uh, it's very similar to Ezekiel's vision uh, over in Ezekiel chapter 1. And, and I can say that we oftentimes miss the point of the four living creatures because we get focused so much on who they are when at the end of the day it really, really matter who they are. What really matters in the text is what they are doing. So these four living creatures that are around the throne of God are, are declaring the praise of God, crying out. And it says that they do not cease day and night. They have no rest, literally, day and night as they say this. These four living creatures, now this doesn't mean that they don't do or say other things. We'll see them a few times in the book of Revelation. But it means that as they are in God's presence, that they are constantly, continually unable to stop praising Him who sits on the throne. And then we have this rainbow. When we talk about rainbow in our world, we sometimes think of something different. But biblically, when we talk about rainbow, usually we think about the covenant of God with Noah and with creation. My bow I'll set in the sky and, 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 and you'll know I will never judge the earth with water again. But it's also a reminder that God had to judge the earth with water in the first place. And it's also a reminder that this fire burning before God, the Spirit burning like a flame before God, is how He's going to judge the world in the end. We don't have to worry about a flood, but the flames are coming. So John sees all of this, and then he sees a sea of glass that's set out before the throne. It's an odd image. You have this big sea of glass. We're going to see it again later in chapter 15, where the saints who have been victorious are standing on the sea of glass, and it looks like it's been mixed with fire. And uh, Solomon, when he built his temple, he built a big, big uh, bathtub, basically. He called it the sea that set out before the temple for people to purify themselves in, the priests to purify themselves in. So the sea concept is there. But in the ancient world, the sea is really an interesting image, an interesting symbol, because the sea always stands for chaos, evil, and death. In the ancient world, if you read the ancient myths, there's, there's typically these myths in which the gods had to contend with the god of the sea that was chaos, evil, and death. And the gods had to somehow overcome the chaos of the sea in order to be able to establish the land and establish uh, the earth and all of those things. And, you know, that's just the way that they thought of things. But it's fascinating to me that the way that we see the sea through the lens of Scripture is not as chaos that God has to contend with, but before the Almighty God on His throne, the sea is like glass as crystal. Now, what does that mean? It means it's perfectly still. There's no movement. There's no raging. There's no chaos. There's no threat before Almighty God on His throne. And so we see the sea that typically stands for evil being a, a raging force having to be calm and still before the Almighty God on His throne. See, He's about to judge and we're going to see all of this chaos and we're going to see all of this death. But we need to remember as we see all of that that God is in control. That there is no threat to Him. And so we have this image set before us of God on the throne and color and light radiating out from him and these 24 thrones around him and the sea before him and the spirit of God burning before him and these four living creatures crying out and as I said what they do is more important than who they are what they cry out is what we read earlier from Isaiah 6 holy 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 it's the Lord God the almighty who was who is who is to come See, in the Hebrew, they don't have superlatives. They don't say good, better, best. The way that they're able to express that is through repetition of a word. So when we sang earlier this morning, holy, 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 what we were doing is a Hebraism in which we were saying God is the most holy, the holiest. I'm not sure what the proper English grammar is for the superlative of holy. They're crying out that there is no one like God. I said holy, it means to be set apart, to be separate, to be other. 
And, and we can be holy, and we should be holy in the way that we live. Christians are called to be holy in this impure and defiled world. The way we should live should be reflecting more God and less of the world. We can, be, uh, we can see holiness in, in, in a judgment context, and that God sets things apart to be holy unto judgment, and that they are going to be condemned. We can be holy in a lot of different ways, but we are all of us in some way profane, some way common, some way linked to one another. And even if you don't know me or you don't know my history, you don't know my life or you don't, maybe you do and you're like, I don't connect with that guy. It doesn't matter how distant we could be or how close we are. At some point, we are all bound together in that we are created and that we are humans, that we are sinners. We are in a class together. God is in a class of his own. He is unique. Whoever the 24 elders are, whoever the four living creatures are, it doesn't really matter. God's not like them either. God is the most holy. He is separate from all of creation. So we'll see in a moment because he is the one who made all of creation. He is the Lord God, the Almighty. When John received this vision, he was on the island of Patmos and the Caesar who was in control at that time was a man who liked to call himself the Lord and God. And John has shown this vision in which he sees who the Lord God truly is. You see, Caesar, he would rule and he would reign and he would have sovereignty for quite some time over a quite a large amount of people in a huge geographic area. But Caesar would die. And the next guy would come and he would die. The next guy would come and he would die. We go in four year cycles here in our nation but the leaders come and the leaders go powers arise and powers fall nations are built and nations are torn down but God he is forever almighty who was who is who is to come see God is in a class of his own we may be now and we will always be because of the way God has made us but there was a time when you weren't Even the four living creatures and all of their weird glory. There was a time when they weren't. But when it comes to our holy God, there was never a time when he wasn't. And there will never be a time when he isn't. He is the eternal one who has all power, all might. All strength, that's who God is. And so they declare this, the holiness of God, over and over and over. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a church that likes to sing the same song over and over and over. And it can get really tiring sometimes. You're like, okay, uh, Micah, we've sung that verse like 20 times now. Not that Micah would do that. But, but these guys don't get tired of it. Like there's no indication that they're like, we need to move to the next song, God. This is getting tiresome. Because those who are closest to God are the ones who can't help but declare His glory over and over and over again. It's we who are far away who get tired of recognizing and confessing the holiness of God. Those who are in His presence can't help but worship Him forever and ever and ever. It's we who are far away who begin to forget, begin to reject, or even begin to despise having to worship this holy God. Psalm 2 <clears throat> Psalm 2 says, Why are the nations in an uproar? In the people's devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord God Almighty who sits on his glorious throne laughs. He scoffs at them. And he'll speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. My friends, when we see the nation's rage and evil people advancing, or we see our lives collapsing and pain creeping in, we can get mad, we can get scared, and we can act out of those emotions and the way we respond to those situations, or we can change our perspective. 
Because no matter how much the nations rage, God is on his throne laughing at their futility. And no matter how much chaos may seem to infiltrate your life, God is on the throne. The sea is still before him. We can forget God when life gets tough. We can blame God. We can turn against God who reigns forever and ever. But it is foolish. It is absolutely foolish to forget God because this moment is unpleasant or difficult. It is foolish to put God aside, to put away the one who was, who is, and who is to come because this moment gets tough. When life gets bad, friends, remember God is holy. Or on the other side of things, when we see the glories of this life, we can get distracted, we can get compromised. We can get our eyes taken away from the thing that matters most, God on his throne, and we can become distracted by the pleasures of this world, and we can become distracted by the delights and the glory of this world. And we begin to turn our eyes away from God because we like so much what we see set before us. Some people chase money, some people chase relationships, some people chase influence, some people chase power, some people chase security, some people chase pleasure, some people chase comfort. I mean, people chase all of these things and they put God to aside, aside to chase something less. But God is holy, which means that he is better than everything else. How foolish it is when we give up God because we're pursuing our children or our grandchildren instead of him. How foolish it is when we give up God because we're pursuing our career and we're pursuing our money, the security we think it buys us or the luxury and comfort we think it gives us. How foolish it is to give up God for any reason. I don't care what the pleasures of this world are that are seductive and tempting you away from God. Please remember when that comes, God is holy, therefore God is better than all of it. When life is good, remember God is better. I think we often forget the holiness of God because we get too distracted by our Pride that says we are worthy of the things we want. So as we continue this throne room vision, we're going to see God is not only holy, he is, he is the only one who's actually worthy of all the things we pursue for ourselves. Verse 9, it says, And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created Psalm 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory. Do His name. Worship the Lord in holy array. These four living creatures and 24 elders are doing exactly that. As they cry out, these four living creatures, this grand proclamation, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. These 24 elders that are surrounding the throne of God, they fall down before God. They cast their crowns before the Almighty God and they begin to declare that he is worthy. Now we don't know who these 24 elders are. As we said, they're clothed in a symbol of purity and righteousness. They have golden crowns which indicates royalty and certainly prestige. Uh, some people have wondered if they're just an angelic council that surrounds God, if maybe they're a symbolic representation or maybe even a literal representation of the Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. you got 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, the math works out, so maybe that's it. Uh, there's a lot of different theories about who they are. And again, it really doesn't matter who they are. What matters for us is what they're doing here. So these are 24 people who are standing around the throne of God who are arrayed in righteousness and, and crowned with glory and when God begins to get praised by the four living creatures which by the way happens all the time they get up fall down and worship him 
So, you know, you got the 7-Eleven song, so, so the same music leader's up here, he's going over and over and over, and every time he gets to the chorus, you've got to get up and fall down. And you get back up, you sit down, and then I hope it's the chorus again. We've got to get up, we've got to fall down. This is over and over and over again, this depiction of these 24 elders constantly falling prostrate before the holy God on his throne. Falling down before him is an act of total surrender and submission to him. It is what the word worship means most literally, to fall down before. And so they are worshiping God in total humility and surrender recognizing that while they may have glory and majesty and splendor here in heaven surrounding the throne of God, they're nothing compared to the one who sits on the throne. Amen. And this was most astounding to me in, the, in the, the depiction of them taking their crowns and throwing them down. Now, like in, in our Christian context, we often talk about what our rewards are going to be and we want uh, many jewels in our crown or we want the mansion over the hilltop or things like that. As if somehow those things we're going to get when we get to heaven, that's really what we're hoping for. And I, I really hope that my crown's got more jewels than yours so that I can boast. Of it's like, wow, we've totally missed the whole point. So when we get to heaven, who cares? I mean, literally, they, nobody cares about what crown you've got. Everybody cares about him who sits on the throne. If even these 24, whoever they might be, are not considering themselves worthy to wear their crown before God, do you think you will be? They take off their crown and they throw it before the sovereign God and they declare, no, you are worthy. Now this word worthy, it's an, it's an interesting word. It's a word that means to, to make an evaluation. And uh, oftentimes the image that comes to mind when we would use this word is that of a scale. And so you have a scale on one side, you place something, on the other side you place something, you see if they equal out. If they do, then the one is worthy of the other. And so the idea is that the, the, from what they're saying is that glory, honor, and power is on one side of the scale and the Lord God is on the other side of the scale. And when they examine God and they evaluate who He is, they recognize He brings the scales into balance. He's worthy to have these things. You and I would never bring the scales into balance, by the way. You may think that you should bring the scales into balance. You may think that you should get glory and honor, respect and prestige. You may think that you should get power and control so that you can make your life the way that you want. But you would never bring the scales into balance. You are not worthy of these things. I am not worthy of these things. The 24 elders are not worthy of these things. There is one who is worthy, one who brings the scales into balance. That's the Lord God Almighty. Glory and honor. You know, we have this idea of prestige and this idea of, of weightiness and heaviness to who God is. We honor and glorify a lot of people in our world and in our lives. And we elevate them to a position that really only God should have because only He is truly worthy of these things. Power is the ability to do and only God is worthy of ultimate power. And I want you to note that it says, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. That word receive, it can mean passively to receive, but it's not a passive verb here. So it, when it's not a passive verb, when it's active, it, it, it means to, to take. And so, you know, we're supposed to ascribe to the Lord glory that's due to His name, but they're saying that God is not just worthy for everybody to give Him glory, he is also worthy to take it even if we're not willing to. Do, do we understand that God is, is, is worthy? He has the right to make all creation worship Him and bow down before Him. When we go through, through Revelation and we see the way that God treats those who dwell on the earth who have rejected Him, there can be thoughts of, wow, that's mean, that's harsh. God is, man, God's a bully. God's this, that, and the other. God is God, and we are not. If we were to do the things God does, we would be wrong because we're not God, but He is holy, and therefore He is worthy to make every knee bow before Him and every tongue confess who He is. They're declaring He is worthy not just to passively receive these, but to actively get these for Himself. It's not selfishness on God's part when He fights for His own glory. Because of your will, or because you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. 
This is a common teaching throughout Scripture. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. That's the foundation for all of theology and for all of the biblical message. God, the Eternal One, spoke out of nothing everything. There is nothing that is that did not come through His power. And because He created everything, because of His will they are, and they continue to be, because of that, He's worthy to take the glory, the honor, and the power. Why are you not worthy to take it? Because you didn't make anything. See, it's selfishness on our parts when we fight for our own glory, our own honor, our own control, our own power, our own place. It's selfish when we fight for ourselves because that's not the whole point. It's not selfish when God fights for his glory in creation because he made everything for his glory. The whole point is for his glory. And so they declare this, and we'll see this several times in Revelation. Like I said, it's all throughout Scripture that because God is the creator God, he is worthy to be praised, to be worshipped, to be honored, to be glorified, and to be trusted. And if we're not living for his glory, then we're missing the whole point. And so as John begins this grand revelation in which we're going to see a lot of odd things, a lot of scary things, he begins by seeing the most important thing, and that is the holy and the worthy God sitting on the throne in control, in power, being praised as is right and proper. It's amazing to me as I've considered this message, this is one of the more moving chapters for me in the book of the Bible, is in our world we celebrate a lot of people for a lot of different reasons and you know we have award shows and we have uh, celebrations for accomplishments and we we honor and we glorify uh, athletes and, and actors and singers and politi- well maybe not politicians so much but <laughs> they, they glorify themselves so we don't need to do that but Uh, We honor and celebrate all of these people, but then when it comes to coming to church and it comes to God, we're more concerned about ourselves than Him. Like, we'll show deference to people of power and prestige around us, but then when it comes to God, we're more concerned about our comfort during the church service. Well, we'll show respect to those who, who have influence in our lives and have gained a position that seems really important. But then when it comes to God, we have the audacity to, to, to argue with him about what his will is for our lives and to say, no, God, I don't think this is right. See, we forget who God is. And thus we treat him as if he's one of us. And we believe the gospel that God took on flesh, that Jesus Christ took on flesh, became a man to suffer and to die in our place so that the sins of humanity could be atoned for. We believe that. But even with Jesus' incarnation, he's still the holy God. He is not like us. And should not be treated as our contemporary or as our equal. When you come into this place, you should come solely for the glory of Almighty God. When you go out from this place, you should go out solely for the glory of the Almighty God. He is worthy of such devotion, honor, and respect. One day he's going to take it. But today he mercifully gives us the opportunity to give it freely. I believe that it is significant that those who stand before God have no problem denying themselves, casting away their crowns, and worshiping Him. When we have a problem with it, it just shows how distant we are from the Holy God. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise You. For You are holy Holy, holy. And we recognize that we cannot even fathom what all that means. But we confess that you are not like us. You are pure and righteous. You are just and good. And where all men fail, you succeed. And where things are impossible you accomplish you are the Lord God the Almighty and we praise you you are worthy 
You know, we confess in our hearts that we are selfish and seek our own instead of your glory. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us and that you would give us a glimpse into who you are that we might be so captivated by who you are that our lives would never be the same. Lord, do not allow us to forget I pray you'd constantly remind us of who you are, that our lives might be lived forever for your glory. It is the chief purpose of man. Help us, Lord, to carry out our purpose and to give you the glory and the honor and the thanksgiving that you deserve. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now next week when we hit chapter 5, we're going to see the love of God and the victory of Jesus Christ. But I want to say this, God is worthy of worship without having saved us. I thought about putting these two chapters together, but I think this is a very significant point for us to remember. God is worthy of worship without having saved us. If Jesus never came and died for us, and we were going to spend an eternity separated from God, he would still be worthy for us to fall down before him and say, you are God, holy, holy, holy. The beautiful gospel message is that God has saved us. That even though he didn't have to, his love flowed out of his holiness and he brought forth salvation and life for those who would trust in Jesus Christ. Salvation begins by recognizing who you are in your desperate need. But I don't think you're going to be able to recognize who you are until you begin to recognize who God is. Because it's only contrasted with his glory and his splendor and his holiness that we begin to see as Isaiah did, wretched man that I am, woe is me. And so as you, as you reflect on this text this morning, as we prepare to, to respond to God's word, I invite you to consider who God is to you. We've talked about who God is in reality. The scriptures have shown us that. But who is God to you? And we do that by considering the role that he plays in our lives. If God is not the Lord of your life, the goal of your life, or the source of your life, then you've missed the whole point of this thing we call life. See him for who he is. Worship him for who he is. And you will know the joy that these creatures in heaven know forever. He is holy. He is worthy. Let us bow down before Him and declare His praises today. Stand with me and let's sing.